Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Hello and welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Sands, and I'm here to help you make the most of your mineral rights and royalties. And Justin Williams is here with me today. Hey, Justin. Hey, good morning, Matt. Happy 2021. Happy 2021. Uh, Off to a good start so far. We're just a few days into the new year, but uh, things are looking up like we talked about before. And we're going to talk today about a topic that has been in the news lately, especially in California. And we'll talk about this at the end and some of the interesting developments that have occurred in the market for this particular commodity. But what we're going to talk about today is water rights and what they are and kind of what you need to know and how are they similar and how are they different to mineral rights. So we're going to dive into that. But before we get started, Just a disclaimer that the information that we're going to share in this episode shouldn't be construed as legal advice. As with all areas of the law, water law is constantly changing. And if you have a specific legal question, you should definitely contact an attorney that specializes in water law in your jurisdiction. So with that aside, we'll just go ahead and dive in. And so the first question Many people have, uh, you know, when they hear the term water rights, is what does this mean and what does it refer to? And water rights, in terms of water law, refers to the right of a user to use water from a given source, like a river, a stream, lake, uh, it could be groundwater or surface water. And so that use of water and the right to use it is all governed by law in various states. There's different doctrines that dictate how water is used in different parts of the country. And it sort of goes along with whether water is plentiful or not in that area. Do water rights only come into play, Matt, where water is relatively scarce, uh, like for instance, the Western US, or does it apply everywhere, including where water is plentiful? So that's a great question, Justin. And um, water rights, from the research that we did preparing for this episode, what I found is that they can apply to areas where water is both plentiful as well as those areas that are more arid or where it's more dry. Now, where water is more plentiful, you could sort of divide the the U.S. in half and say the eastern half of the U.S., generally speaking, water is more plentiful you don't hear about it maybe as much in the news or d- dealing with it on a day-to-day basis because the right to use water is governed a little bit differently than it is in the West. And also it's not usually challenged because water is, is plentiful and the water rights are concurrent with the ownership uh, of the land upon which the water flows. And so in these areas where water is more plentiful, what is often called riparian principles apply. And riparian just means the land that exists along a river or stream. So where these riparian legal principles exist, you may have the right to remove water for reasonable use from that stream or river adjacent to your land. And examples of reasonable use could include things like watering livestock, uh, drinking water, watering a garden, and then other things that are considered artificial uses, like using water to irrigate crops or water for industrial uses, also may be considered reasonable use of the water. So as with everything, it depends on state to state. And so check the laws in your state and consult with an attorney if you have questions. In the western half of the U.S., where it's more arid, things developed a lot um, differently. And in those states uh, that follow what's called the prior appropriation system, follow a different method for dictating who owns the water rights. And that system spells out who can use the water, the types of uses that are allowed, and when they can use the water, similar to the riparian system. But in this case, with the prior appropriation system, it's more uh, on a first come, first serve basis. So a common saying for this system is first in time, first in right. So if you can imagine back when the miners first 
moved west and they started to need to use water for mining and other uses like that. And if they were the first person to appropriate the water and start using it, uh, whether it's for mining or to water crops, for example, they have the first right to use that water within that particular watershed. And a court decree is often obtained to confirm their priority status. And if you are the first in time, you have what's called a senior water rights, and you would be a senior water rights holder. And in that case, if you own senior water rights, your water right must be satisfied before any other water rights come into play. And this can be a problematic in states in the western half of the U.S., especially in times of water shortage. And there are issues sometimes with being able to fulfill the needs of all the different water rights holders. And so in western states like Colorado, there is a division of water resources and there are district courts called water courts that only hear matters related to water. And so it's a very um, complex and um, contentious topic in the West where uh, where things are, are fairly dry. Uh, Justin, do you want to talk about whether water rights can be bought or sold? Sure. Uh, so, yes. Water rights are conveyed as real property interest using the same formalities as real estate um, with certain exceptions. Transfers are done typically with a deed, which is recorded in the clerk and uh, recorder's office, just as with deeds for land or for mineral rights. Conveyance of a groundwater right would require that a change of ownership form for the well permit be submitted to the state engineer's office. Very interesting, Matt. And uh, like you said, it seems very like a very complicated world of its own. It is very complicated. And you know, say you purchase some land and or own land in the West, how do you figure out what water rights go with your land? So in Colorado, there is no ownership registry for water rights. The Office of the State Engineer does not have any ownership information. If you want to find out which water rights go to your land, you must research the deeds at your county clerk office. When purchasing land with a well or surface right, the water right must be identified and understood so that both seller and buyer can agree on what rights are to be conveyed in the transaction. A buyer must obtain as much information as possible about the water rights to ensure that the seller has adequate title to the water right that they prefer to own. Recorded documents do not always reveal the full picture for chain of title or conditions of use. Uh, Records for water rights are notoriously sloppy and incomplete. Uh, Research into the records of the state engineer's office and water court is often required. A skilled water law attorney may be required to locate the necessary documents or to issue an opinion regarding chain of title and use uh, restrictions for a water right. Yeah, this sounds a lot like mineral rights. If you are looking at purchasing mineral rights or somehow acquiring them, there's the need to do a title search. And so it sounds like in the case of water rights, that would also be the case. So is it something, though, where the water rights are typically sold with the surface land? So, for example, if I have a farm and I sell that farm, are the water rights uh, usually included in, in that transaction? So it depends. Like we mentioned before, you have to do your due diligence and understand if the previous owner has title to the water rights. And again, it may depend on where the property is located. Um, It's a very good idea to hire an attorney to help locate and review the title to the property to ensure that you um, do fully understand what it is that you're getting. You know, probably too, it would depend, I guess, on what uh, doctrine the state follows. I guess if you're in a riparian state where by definition, uh, the right to use the water goes with the land adjacent to the waterway, that would be probably included. But in the West, where you're following the prior appropriation doctrine, I imagine it's a lot more complicated, like you mentioned. So always uh, hire a qualified attorney to help you with that if if there's any question at all about the water rights, huh? Absolutely, definitely. And it was something that may be kind of counterintuitive. Um, Using the water that runs through your property, Matt, is that always the case that you have the right to that? Or how does that work? Yeah, that's a good point. I think that it depends on where you're located, like you mentioned before. Uh, In some cases, you know, you you could have a situation where, you know, the water may flow through your property and you're in the West and you don't have the water rights for that waterway, then then the answer would probably be no, that you, you wouldn't have right to use that water. Whereas if you're again in that riparian system, then you would have rights uh, to that water. But you know, it's sort of a tricky situation, again, depending on the state that you're in and the laws within that state. And the thing that's interesting about water, too, is 
depending on where you're at, you may think that you would have the water rights, but you know, non-use over a period of time may actually result in the water right being considered abandoned. And you would have to take some steps potentially if you had like a conditional water right or some other uh, water right that has been um, unused for a period of time and, and has been declared abandoned. Uh, and for example, in Colorado, every 10 years, the division engineer prepares an abandonment list which contains water rights that are believed to be either completely or partially abandoned. And so you'd have to go through some steps to try to, to maintain your claim to that water right. So. And, and it's really interesting that it works that way because it, it seems um, different in mineral rights in that way, in that you may come up with a situation rather than finding out you own something you didn't know you had, um, needing to use something and finding out that you don't own it and can't use it, uh, which doesn't sound like it would be a very fun process to go through. Yeah, I can imagine it wouldn't be fun and probably pretty expensive to, to hire an attorney to, to help you out with that. But Absolutely. And so what are the different types of priority around uh, water rights? You mentioned earlier senior water rights. And how is a priority established um, with respect to water rights? Yeah, that's a great question. And it depends on, again, where you're at. But the first person uh, that puts the water to beneficial use has the first right to use the water uh, within, uh, for example, a state that has a that follows the prior appropriation doctrine. Now, that being said, many local governments actually have the most senior water rights. And so you have sort of, I guess, this hierarchy of potentially the, the government and then the senior water rights holder have next you know, priority. And then below them are what is called junior water rights holders. And they can be different levels of this. And so it just goes back to when you put that water to beneficial use and the water courts will adjudicate that and say, okay, you have first priority, you have second priority, you have third priority and down the line. And this priority system affects who has the right to use the water, as you can imagine. In years where water is plentiful and the river is flowing at the edge of its banks, then maybe it's not an issue and there's enough water to go around. But in times where um, there are water shortages, like when there's a drought, there may not be enough water to satisfy uh, the junior water rights holder's needs. So the senior water rights holder takes their share first, and there may not be anything left for anybody else. And so this is um, a situation like the Colorado River is one that I think people may be familiar with across the country you know, flows from, from Colorado west through the Grand Canyon and into the Pacific Ocean. And as you get further west, a lot of times because people have that, those senior water rights along the, uh, the river in times where there's a drought, that flow just a trickle um, the further you go along uh, the river. So it becomes a, an issue if you do have junior water rights and you need to um, potentially have some some backup plans to uh, fulfill your water needs in times of uh, drought. Now, the other th interesting thing about water rights in states with that prior appropriation system is you don't have to own the land adjacent to the body of water in order to own the water rights to that land. And so this is, again, where it can get really complicated. And like you mentioned, where you have the these title issues that come into play and have to do your research and figure out who actually owns what. And this is um, really similar to mineral rights in that mineral rights can get severed from the surface rights. And if you own the surface land, you may not necessarily own the mineral rights below that land and, and vice versa. So again, if you own a tract of land and want to drill a water well, usually there are steps in place that will allow you to do that. Even if you don't own the water rights, if you're in a Again, one of those prior appropriation system states, but you still have to follow some certain rules and the states will follow what's called the reasonable use doctrine, which uh, would indicate that you are more than likely entitled to use the groundwater below your property as long as that use doesn't unreasonably interfere with your neighbors or with other water right owners. And again, it just really depends from state to state. So you really need to. Um, to get help from a qualified attorney if that is the case. And usually like in Colorado, for example, if you're going to drill a well on your property, you have to 
get a permit and go through the water board and they'll have to approve it and make sure that it's not going to adversely affect anybody. Absolutely. And you touched on this a little bit earlier, Matt, but do you want to go a little bit more in depth on if water bites can be considered abandoned, if they're not used, and how do they keep that from happening? Yeah, that's a, this is an interesting one because it depends on the, uh, again, the, the state that you're in. in. In the states that follow riparian rights, what I found was that landowners don't necessarily have to use the water in order to keep their right. And that's just because the right is attached to that riparian land. So by definition, it's it goes with the land and, and you don't have to use it in order to uh, maintain that right. Now, that said, uh, some states may have a system for allocating water to use to help them plan for the future. And so you may have to go through some uh, some steps just to sort of inform them of, of the use and, and or non-use. And so, again, check with your state law and contact a water attorney for assistance if you're in, a, in that situation. But then, like we talked about before, if you're in a state that follows the prior appropriation doctrine, many of those states, you may be required to continually use the water. Otherwise, it could be deemed to have been abandoned. So in Colorado, for example, uh, abandonment is where the water right might be terminated, again, in whole or in part, as a result of the failure of the owner to put that water right to beneficial use when it was available for a period of 10 or more years. So if you're in a drought situation, you have a more junior water right, you just couldn't physically um, use it because it's not there. That may be a different situation, but in general, the statutes indicate that they'll review the various usage of the of the water. And every 10 years, the division engineer is required to present to the water court a list of water rights that they have found to be abandoned. And then the burden is on the owner of that water right to prove that they did not intend to abandon it. And the process and timeline for that abandonment of water rights are governed by state law. And so We'll have a link to the Colorado timeline and statutes in the show notes, just as an example. Um, but then again, it just varies by state. Very interesting. And since we're a mineral rights show, we'll do a little comparison with water rights versus mineral rights, some similarities and differences. To review what we covered so far, if you're in a state where a prior appropriation doctrine is followed, the owner of the water rights can be anyone. Um, this is very similar to several mineral rights, where anyone can own their minerals below a given tract of land, even if they don't own the surface rights. In states that follow the riparian doctrine, the owner of the land adjacent to the water course also owns the water rights associated with that land. Um, and this is similar to the fee simple ownership of a tract of land, where the surface owner also owns the mineral rights below the land. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a, an easy example for people to, to wrap their hands around. And, you know, I guess the, the question then becomes, especially in the prior appropriation states, if water rights can be bought and sold, and can you lease them to somebody else? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So the answer to this question really depends on the state. Um, but many states, especially those that follow the prior appropriation doctrine, allow the water rights to be severed from the land and leased to another party for a beneficial use. The sale or lease may require approval by the state water agency to ensure that the right steps are followed and to ensure that the new proposed use does not adversely affect other water rights holders. And, you know, something that occurred to me through this, Matt, is, you know, are water rights part of an oil and gas operator's world? Is that something they encounter and have to deal with? You know, my experience has been that the answer to that is yes. Uh, you know, I worked on a project in, in the West where water was going to be needed for that project. And the uh, company was looking at acquiring water rights on a, on a waterway nearby so that they could have access to water. Uh, for that project. And so uh, in my experience, that that has been the case. And, and certainly with these unconventional oil and gas wells that were hydraulically fracturing and requires a lot of water uh, to complete those wells, you know, water is a big deal. And so whether they're having to go out and purchase the water from uh, somebody and either pipe it in or truck it in, or, you know, may actually be more uh, cost effective for them to go out and purchase uh, water rights for that water use. And so I can only imagine that that's part of an operator's world and, you know, whether it's something that they 
are pursuing or thinking about pursuing. It just probably would depend on the economics of the situation, whether it's in the long run cheaper for them to go and purchase the, the water rights and, and have use from, from that way or to get it directly from, you know, waterway versus um, purchasing it. So yeah, that's definitely something that I think they're, they're looking at. Oil and gas, mineral rights, you know, the question always is, what is my property worth? So tying that back to water rights, Justin, can you talk a little bit about how someone might go about understanding what your water rights might be worth? Sure. So like any property uh, transaction, the compensation associated with the sale or lease of water rights is up to the affected parties. Like with mineral rights, and probably more so in the case of water rights, water rights is opaque. And there isn't a Zillow for water rights to say the senior water rights on this waterway is worth X dollars per acre foot. That said, there are firms out there that provide evaluation services for water rights. And like we tell all mineral and royalty owners, you should get an appraisal of your property. If you're thinking about buying or selling uh, mineral rights and the same advice would apply to water rights. An expert in this area can help you understand the likely fair market value and marketability of your water rights and also may be able to help you find a buyer or a lessee. If you're interested in selling or leasing your water rights, there may be brokers who work in your state who can help market your rights for sell or lease. Um, check with your state laws and your water attorney as they can help ensure that the necessary steps are followed when transferring those rights. And Matt, do you want to talk a little bit about um, some of the interesting developments in water rights? Yeah, sure thing. And so in 2020, the uh, water futures began trading for the first time. So we talk about futures contracts. You often talk about oil and uh, you know soybeans. You'll see pork bellies and all these things that are traded, uh, various, various commodities, gold, another one. And Water is now included in that mix for the first time ever. So in 2020, December, I believe, water futures tied to California began trading for the first time. And these water futures can help farmers and municipalities bet on future water availability in that state. And these water contracts, again, are they're, they're first of their kind in the U.S., now, some information about these contracts is a little bit different than other commodities, and I'll talk to that here in a second, but the futures are tied to what's called the NASDAQ Velez California Water Index, uh, which has been around for a couple of years, and it's a measure of the average price of water in that particular area. And now a practical example of how this might be used, so if you're a farmer let's say, and you want to lock in water at current prices because you think there is going to be a drought next year, uh, you could buy a futures contract for the time period in question. And in theory, if that price of water goes up over that time period due to scarcity, due to that drought, then the value of that futures contract should go up as well. And so assuming you could sell that contract and pocket the difference, it would help offset the increased cost of water in that at that future date. So that is why um, they might use it. So it's to hedge against prices going up. They can lock in prices at a lower cost than they might be able to get it in the future. Now, of course, it's a bit of a risk and there's a little bit of a roll of the dice as to what might actually happen. So if the cost of water actually goes down, your effective cost would still be what you paid for the contract, which might actually be higher than what you could buy water on the spot market for at that point in the future. So that's always a risk out there. But again, if you wanted to hedge in at a certain price to help with the economics of your farming operation, that's something that could, could happen. And there's certainly going to be, I'm sure, hedge funds and, and other um, large investors that are going to use this as a something to trade and kind of harvest value from from whether they think prices are going to go up or down, whatever the case may be. So um, interesting concept. And the difference between these the water futures and other commodities like crude oil or soybeans is that the water futures are financially settled as opposed to requiring the physical delivery of water in this case. So whereas when you buy a contract for crude oil, you unless you have an offsetting contract so that you don't have to deliver it, you actually are signing up to f require the physical delivery. And so you can either take that or again, buy or sell to sort of offset that contract that you have. So interesting difference there. So it's more of a 
financial instrument to, to hedge on prices. And, and that's usually, you know, how crude oil futures and other futures contracts are used as well. But in this case, there is no requirement that you take the physical delivery of water. Uh, and each contract represents uh, 10 acre feet of water, which is equal to around 3.26 million gallons. So interesting developments. Uh, again, water is a, uh, is a big deal and it will continue to be a big deal as we have, uh, you know, droughts and those types of things in the West. So, Absolutely. Very interesting look at uh, water rights. Definitely learned a lot from this and appreciate you doing the research, Matt. Absolutely. And we'll link to all of the resources that we found uh, in preparation for this show uh, in the show notes. Uh, you can go to mineralrightspodcast.com for this episode, and you'll find the links to those uh, resources that we found that has more information. So thanks again for listening. Happy New Year to everybody. And uh, hope you found this information useful. And as always, you know, contact a qualified attorney in your jurisdiction if you have issues around water rights or, you know, things like that. So thanks again. Thanks, Matt. Thanks so much for listening to the Mineral Rights Podcast with your host, Matt Sands. Don't forget to subscribe and share at mineralrightspodcast.com. The Mineral Rights Podcast should not be construed as investment, legal, or tax advice. All information is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy.